First Timothy chapter three, verse 16. As you turn there, you know, last night we focused a lot on needing to have God create in us a clean heart. Tonight, I aim to pair that with a head knowledge because you are going to need a head knowledge. You're going to need to know what you're talking about if you are going to claim Christ and proclaim him because there will be opposition. While you're turning to 1 Timothy 3.16, I want to read a couple of scriptures first from Titus chapter 1 in verse 9. It is speaking of the qualifications for an overseer or what we would call a pastor. One of the things that an overseer must hold fast to is the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to reprove those who contradict. You need to be ready to hold fast to the faithful word. And in Jude... Verses 3 and 4, it says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, exhorting you that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. The enemy is eager in this day to pick apart your faith in Christ. He is eager to pick off Christians. The enemy takes no days off. If you ever want to see if that's actually happening, say Jesus a few more times. No one's offended when you say God. God can unfortunately mean a whole lot of things, but you start proclaiming Jesus a little bit too much and you are going to get some backlash. You are going to get challenges. We know from these passages that what we need to have is a true knowledge of Christ. We need to gather from his word who he is and what he is. We need to know the difference and we need to be prepared. So many times in life, So far in ministry, I haven't been in it too long. I've had people ask me, well, how do I know if someone is trying to trip me up? How do I know if I'm being led into some false sense of belief? And I I don't have a one word answer that will protect you. I don't have a shield I can put up for you. But one of the easiest ways to defend against apostasy and defend against false belief is ask them, what do you do with Jesus? What do you believe about Jesus? Who is Jesus? What is Jesus? Because almost all of them, they have to get Jesus wrong. Because if you get Jesus right by the word of God, you will praise and honor and worship him. But if you intentionally turn God's word and twist it and make it say things that it doesn't, you will end up praising men. You end up praising Church, you end up praising a system or a denomination. But if you get the true Christ, you will only praise him. He is not just our Savior, he is our God. In the Greek, it was kurios Iesus, was the cry of the early church. Where they were under Roman persecution, the Romans demanded that they say, kurios Caesar, which is to say, Caesar is Lord. They didn't just ask it, they demanded it. The early church responded back with kurios Iesus. Jesus is Lord. But you better be able to defend it. Because mama said or because daddy said or because my pastor said, will not cut it. You must have together with a heart knowledge, a head knowledge. If you want to know who Jesus is, I've got one quick verse for you. 1 Timothy 3, 16, and it's so easy to remember. We can all remember John 3, 16. 1 Timothy 3, 16 says this. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was manifested in the flesh 
was vindicated in the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. This is a doxology or a short hymn of the local New Testament church. The songs are not limited to the book of Psalms in the Bible. You can see if you look in your Bible, it's typically going to be sorted in a way. It's sorted by syllables. And you can see it line by line. This was a short version of a song, a doxology that the early church would cry out and sing. He who was manifested in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. In the Greek, it would have fit perfectly together with the syllables and, and everything. In our English, it gets a little bit long in some places, but the point is, it is a doxology of our worship of Christ. Why do you worship Christ? The answers are all right here. The first part of that verse. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. Before you even get to the doxology, it is assumed among many that this is. By common confession, it is a mystery of godliness. Godliness is not something that is merely taken in by academics. It is not some mere thing because many a people have had Bibles and have missed Christ. Many an atheist own a Bible and miss Christ. The Pharisees and the Sadducees knew more of Scripture than any man, any men in Jerusalem or in Israel, and they miss Christ. You can have the Word of God and miss Christ. Great is the mystery of godliness. It says mystery because it is the Holy Spirit that works in a heart that opens its eyes to see its need of a Savior and who its true Savior is. To the others, they see merely just words and parables. But here, beginning in the first line, he who was manifested, who, easy for me to say, he who was manifested in the flesh, God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus is not some imagined, made up thing. He is not a created creature. He was not carved out of wood. He is not the product of someone's imagination. He is God the Son. Only God the Son could have this praise and have it be worthy. God the Son revealed in the flesh. We know John 1, 14. As John's gospel opens up in a preamble and it speaks to what Jesus is, not just who he was. We know from the other gospels that he was born in Bethlehem and he was of Nazareth and he had to flee to Egypt. But we know from this, the same thing we know from John's gospel in verse 14 of the first chapter. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Lord tabernacled with us. God walked among us. And some of you might say, well, didn't God walk among the Israelites in the Exodus? Moses, the most holy of man's there was, even he could not look upon the face of God. It was not allowed. We were not able to do that but we were able to look upon the face of christ it is the only face of god you can take in and see if a man looked upon the glory of god he would he would just be destroyed you cannot take it in as a human but you can look upon and will look upon jesus face because he was manifested in the flesh he tabernacled among us back in the old testament times the tabernacle represented the the location of God. It wasn't what he was limited to, but as the Israelites would move through the Old Testament from Exodus all the way through Deuteronomy into the promised land, they had the camp set up in a specific way and they had the tabernacle, which had inside of it the Holy of Holies, which was where God dwelt, where God's presence dwelt. And you could not just go walking in there. Two men walked in that Holy of Holies and God struck them dead. You don't play around with the holiness of God. That's why we are God-fearing. But God was manifested in the flesh in the name of Christ. He was the God whose face we saw. That next part. He was vindicated in the Spirit. Jesus is not some sinner like you and me. Some people like to put flaws on Christ to make Him more relatable. He's relatable enough 
dying on the cross and that he tabernacled among us and took upon flesh. But he was vindicated in the spirit. He is not a sinner like me, nor is he some simply exalted man. He's not just some guy who people raised up and praised. He is so much more. He is justified and righteous. He does not need a justification for sin the way we do. We are born in sin. We must be justified or we stand before God unworthy and unrighteous. We deserve the hell we will get without justification. We have to have justification. That's why pastors and evangelists and all these men that are truly in fear of God and His consequences will beg and plead. Please. Because you know the consequence on the other side. He was vindicated in the Spirit. He doesn't need justification for his sins because he has none. But rather, he is sinless and perfect. And he is the justification for many. Hebrews 7.26 affirms it this way, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. I see people that try to add things on top of Christ. Usually it's, it's well-meaning. It's, it doesn't have a bad intention. But what did Mama say? The, the road to hell often is paved with good intentions. Even so much, I spoke on it last night a little bit about that. What would Jesus do? As if you have the mind of Christ. It's what did Jesus do? There's enough here in the Word. The Word even says in John 20 that there were more things that Jesus did that are not recorded, but these are recorded so that you would believe He is the Son of God. What we have is enough. We have plenty. And even if we did not have a physical Word in our hand, if we just had it on our heart, just sunk down on our heart as Psalm 119, 105 tells us to do, may your Word be hidden in my heart that I might not sin. Even if you just have it in your heart, the truth of God, It is enough. But Jesus, back to our text, He is vindicated in the Spirit. He is not in need of a Savior. He is the Savior. The next part. He was seen by angels. He was witnessed by angels. So very important. Jesus is not merely witnessed by a lone individual. There's not just one witness of Christ and we're going off that one witness of Christ. He is witnessed by many His witness includes carpenters, tax collectors, fishermen, a zealot, a Pharisee, women, a Roman governor's wife, even Pontius Pilate's wife was haunted by the presence of Christ knowing that he would be headed to the gallows. Even she, a godless pagan, God knows how many gods that she worshipped and her husband worshipped, and yet even she knew the truth. Please have nothing to do with that man. Why would a godless pagan care? Because the truth has come out. The truth has even been revealed into her heart in some sort of way that that man is not deserving of the death he is about to go face. It's this amazing book. I I got this book at a pastor's conference. It was about the truths of the gospel that were spoken even by enemies of Christ. And one of them was even talking about the Roman soldiers who put the crown on his head, even though it was a crown to mock him, even though the robe they put on him was so they would mock him and they bowed down and worshipped him and they were probably laughing and they were mocking him, even though they didn't know what they were doing in their imitation. They were putting forth some form of praise, even though it was mockery. Even the enemies of Christ, even Pontius Pilate as he tells them what to put on the sign to put above Christ's cross. Mm -hmm. And the Jews try to come back and say, no, 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 just put that he said he was the king of Jews. And Pontius Pilate, again, godless, pagan, has no reason to believe. Even he says, what I have written will stand. He has no reason to do this. Other than some ounce of truth, make it in there somewhere. Even though his heart would not be turned. But God was seen by angels. Hebrews 1.6 says, And when He again brings the firstborn into the world, He says, Let all the angels of God worship Him. One of the great things that comes about when you speak of Jesus being seen by angels is my, one of my favorite lines in that Christmas song, Mary, did you know? 
that your little baby has walked where angels trod. They know Him because they have been around Him. The angels are created by God. And Jesus is God. He is their Creator. He could have called down 10,000 of them if He wanted to. When he, in Matthew 4, when he's in the desert being tempted in every kind of way after he dispels Satan and gets him to the side, angels come and minister to him. When he is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying that famous prayer, it says that angels minister to him. He is witnessed by angels because they come from the same place down from heaven. They don't only witness him, but they worship him. Read Revelation 4 and 5. The first three chapters of Revelation speak to the church, the different churches. After Revelation 5, we see what the end times will be. But in chapters 4 and 5, you see a picture of the true worship of Christ in the throne room of heaven by the elders around the throne. John sits there and cries and says, There's no one wor- is there no one worthy to take the seal? And then... Here comes Christ. One who is worthy is here. He was seen by angels. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. He was in the flesh. He was perfect and vindicated in the spirit. He was witnessed by angels. He's not just someone's imagination. Next part. He was proclaimed among the nations. Jesus is not restricted or exclusive to some group of wealthy donors. Or those of a particular society. My heart absolutely breaks to people who are caught in cult worship. In which your standing is based on how much money you have put in. How do I get to a higher level? Put in more money. Get a second job so you can work more money and put more money in. Want forgiveness? Put more money in. And in that, in that way, the Lord help me. The congregation, the people, the creation of God begins to worship something that is not God. They begin to worship a system and they begin to worship men. He is proclaimed among the nation. He is not restricted or exclusive to some group of donors or a particular society, but he is the savior of the world. And he is preached among the nations as such. Romans 16, 26 says, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the Gentiles, leading to obedience of faith. He is not restricted to an area. He is not just Middle Eastern Jesus and he's not just American Jesus. He's not Europe's Jesus. He's not Asia's Jesus. He is the Savior of the world. Do not restrict him and keep him. Do not sit there and say it's some white man's religion or some black man's religion. He is the savior of the world. I'm not going to care what your color is in heaven. Next part. He is believed on in the world. He is not just some historical figure. There are so many accounts that will tell even the hardened, most hardened atheist that Jesus really did exist. But he's not just a historical figure who lived and died and shows up in history books. But he is to be believed throughout the world into salvation. It is not enough to just sit there and acknowledge his presence. It is not enough just to acknowledge that he existed. It's not even enough to sit there and just acknowledge that he is godly. Or some people say, oh, Jesus inspires me. If he's not your savior, it's not enough. He has to be your savior. You have to confess Christ. We went over in our church a few weeks ago. You have to make a public profession of faith. Because it cannot be a secret in your heart that you worship and follow Christ. Believed on in the world. 2 Thessalonians 1.10 says, When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, For our witness to you was believed. The job of the church, the job of the Christian is not to keep Jesus as a secret, but it is to proclaim him. Is he your savior? Proclaim him as such. I heard this famous preacher say one time his wife had gotten in a car wreck and they were 
They were all in the hospital waiting for some sort of update on him, on, on her rather. And, you know, the, the, the pastor is there and his, his grown children are there. And, you know, he's standing there. He's in prayer. He's singing hymns. And he's just trying to speak to God in some kind of way. And his daughter, who has been of the faith for so long, is standing there worrying and stressing. And he finally, in a loving way but a strong way, had to look her in the eye and said, if you actually believe that Jesus is your Savior and that God is sovereign and in control, act like it. Come on. That's right. Don't sit there and say you have faith and then run out of faith in trouble. We have to be, that's why you have to continue being built up by the Word because you are going to run into that trouble and your paper-thin faith will fall and crumble. It has to be deeper than just some little foundation. You can't have a tense foundation. You've got to have bedrock. You've got to have, like the church, the church has foundations that are the disciples, but the chief cornerstone is Christ. And the head of the church is Christ. He cannot be... He cannot just be Jesus plus. He can't just be something you add on. He's believed on in the world. Lastly, he was taken up in glory. Jesus is not restricted to some tomb or grave. I can't tell you how many times I see people that they don't say they're doing it, but with their actions I see them doing it. They are worshiping a grave or they are worshiping a tombstone the tombstones and graves that they go to look nicer than the inside of their houses sometimes i've seen them go out there with scissors to cut the grass and i sit there and look and i'm like if you actually believe the things that you say you believe that what is in the ground is just what was left the outer shell and that their soul is in heaven if you actually believe it, act like it. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I don't like going to graves. I get that you want to honor those that are, that are gone that you love so dearly. I get all that. But do you actually believe or are you just saying it? Come on. I don't need to talk to my dead relatives. I don't need to go to some medium like King Saul did. King Saul, one of the big things that got King Saul in trouble was he was standing there and he wanted to get a medium to talk to some dead people. He said, can I channel somebody through a medium to speak to them? And the prophet of God says, what are you doing? Why do you need to talk to some dead person? You need to be in prayer to God. Yes, sir. Yes. What are you channeling the dead for? You know, I might go down a rabbit hole with this. Dr. Walter Martin, one of my favorite evangelists and teachers. One of the things that he said, he was given a lecture on this tarot card reading, these mediums, the palm reading stuff. And you know what? It, it, I've had it run in my family. I had a palm reader in my family. And one of the things he said, he said, you know, one, one of the greatest mistakes that the church made was believing that these people ain't talking to somebody. That's right. They're talking to somebody. They're charging you money and they're claiming that they got grandma on the hotline they can tell you everything she's saying. Come on. Grandma's not an angel. That's right. And she ain't God. Those people are channeling demonic spirits. And they are lying to you. They are giving you what you want to hear. Right. They want more of your money. Come on. Don't sit there and take their word for granted. I take the word of God as it says. Amen. That I will see them. If they are saved by the grace of God, I will see them again in glory because I am saved by the grace of yes. God. Yes. And you know what? And if they're not, I won't. That's right. And that will be a heartbreak. That's why you get out there and you share Jesus with the ones you love the most. There's no second chance. But he's taken up in glory. He's not restricted to a tomb or a grave. He has no headstone for me to go visit, nor does he have a memorial built that I should go lay flowers at because he is in glory for his work for our salvation is complete. Hebrews 1.3 says, who is, speaking of Jesus, who is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power who having accomplished 
cleansing for sin, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus' death was once and once was enough. There's no need to re-sacrifice Christ over and over and over again. There's a reason that the sacrificial system ends with Christ. Every sacrifice before Christ was imperfect. They just tried to get the least imperfect one they could find, but they all had imperfections. But none of those could pay the price that Christ did. The blood of bulls and lambs could only temporarily satisfy. But then the very next day, sin would be committed again and they would have to re-sacrifice all over again. It's one of those things where if you were a priest in the Old Testament, I heard one guy say, you know, people think a priest and they think of some, some high and mighty guy with the white robe on and all that stuff. Old Testament priests dealt in a lot of blood because they had to keep sacrificing over and over and over. It's a bloody business. It's no longer needed. The precious blood of the perfect lamb has been slain. There's no need to repeat. Once and for all and once was enough. Don't bring Jesus down here and act like, well, he's got to sacrifice for me again. Once was enough. He was taken up in glory. He is not sitting in some tomb where you can go visit him. He barred it for a few days and ascended into heaven. One of the most beautiful things in John 20, when it talks about Resurrection Sunday, it says that the, the linen wrappings that were around his body were left behind. And the one that was around his face was neatly folded and left behind. There was a great fear among his disciples that his body would be stolen. And that same fear was among the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's why they not only had the tomb guarded, but had it sealed. If somebody had stolen his body, they would have taken the wrappings with them. I doubt they would have been running out with some naked body. And they wouldn't have been neatly folded the wrapping that was upon our Lord and Savior's face. It was left behind because he no longer needed it. It was all temporary to pay the price. When he was on the cross and he said, to tell us die, it is finished. It was finished. And when he gave it up, there's a great scene where it talks about the, the veil in front of the Holy of Holies being ripped in the temple. And that temple would end up being destroyed in 70 AD. Because no longer was God's presence to be restricted in some sort of way by man's standards. That no, 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 only a priest can come in here. It's like Zechariah when he, when he went to go in. They had a rope tied around his waist because... If he went in there and he had some unconfessed sin, they were going to have to pull his body out of there. No longer was his presence restricted to a temple or inside of the Holy of Holies because he left behind the Holy Spirit, which is his very presence within us. That's right. yes. And it's our job to feed the Holy Spirit, continue to be in Scripture, to continue to be in praise. Because when we get on the other side and we're not doing those things and we're intentionally sinning and going against God, Scripture says that we quench the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't lose power. He's God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He doesn't lose power. You're just no longer interested in doing His will. And His presence will leave. The anointing will come off of you. And you'll be sitting there wondering, well, how do I get it back? How did it come about in the first place? By being in the presence of God and doing His will. But all this truth, comes back to Christ. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh. He was with us. He had flesh upon him. He was vindicated in the spirit. He was perfect. He was seen by angels. He was witnessed by many. He was proclaimed among the nations. He's not restricted to some area. He is believed on in the world. He is to be proclaimed and worshiped and praised. And he was taken up in glory. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. The scripture says that as we go, we stand before a just and righteous God and we have nothing to offer God. We are His, crea he, we are his creation that has fallen short. If God stands before us and says, why do I let you in? 
This sin, this sin, this sin, this sin, this sin, this violation of the law, that violation of the law. You have no standing before a just and righteous God. Your only response is, I do not. But that man on the middle cross said, if I place my faith in him, him, confess my sins and praise him as my Lord and Savior, and he intercedes on our behalf before the Father. And it is because of his intercession alone that we gain passage into glory. You have no right to heaven. Heaven is a privilege, not a right. That's right. The very act of faith, the very thing of uh, faith that you have is initiated by God. It is He that speaks to a heart. It is His Holy Spirit that does a work in a heart that allows a heart and makes a heart to see that it has a need of a Savior that you are empty inside without Christ. It is a work of God. No man could do that. No preacher can talk you into it. No teacher can talk you into it. No Sunday school teacher can talk you into it. No man can convince you of it. It is a work of God that speaks to a soul and says that it needs a Savior. And it needs a perfect Savior. It can't have salvation in Moses. It can't have salvation in the Apostle Paul or Apollos. There were times in the New Testament in Paul's letters where he's talked about how there was division in the church. Some of you say... You know, I'm of Apollo. Some of you say I'm of Paul, of these other things. And he and Paul comes in and says we need to be of Christ, not of a teacher. That teacher should be pointing you to Christ. We preach Christ crucified, not Paul says or Apollo says or this teacher says or that teacher says. We must have oneness in Christ. We must have oneness in him because it is only him that can save. The very truth of this verse, just this one verse, can protect you, the Christian, from the schemes of those who want to do anything to diminish your witness of Christ. They want to eat away at your faith in Christ, and they do it in nitpicky ways. It starts off small. It's like a termite. A termite doesn't eat a house in one day. He nibbles at the foundation. And as he continues to nibble, he brings company with him. And they'll soon enough, they'll take a leg out. And then they move on to the next. They move on to the next. And all of a sudden, your house is caved in. As Paul says, you have shipwrecked your faith. You must have a strong foundation in the Word of God. You must know who your Savior is. That He truly did come. He was in the flesh. He was both God and He was man. We call Him the God-man because He was both. The hypostatic union is what speaks to how that intertwines, that he was both God and man. One was not less than the other. He was fully both at the same time. That's why he bled on the cross. These things that want to chip away at your faith, they want to change how you view Jesus. There are some abominations in the land these days that will chip away at some of the smallest details that you've held close to your whole life. There is one group of people, a cult, that will sit there and tell you that, yes, Jesus is God's son, but he's God's son because God had relations with Mary. They'll teach you this. They say, he was born just like you were. God the Father had relations with Mary, and that's how he was conceived. When we know by Scripture that Mary was a virgin, And then it was the power of the Holy Spirit that came upon her and she remained a virgin until she gave birth. The most basic of Christian truth. They will chip away at this. They'll try to sit there and nitpick other things. Or they'll say that, well, Jesus was a good man who was adopted into being God. And it's like, oh, all right. Well, what about the Father? Well, the Father's the same thing. Well, someone had to make Him God and it turns into what we call an infinite regress. You have to keep going back and back and back and back. And it's like, where is the foundation in this? A deliberate misrepresentation of the Word of God. God has always been. He's timeless and He's perfect. John chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1. He has always been. He has no start and end point. He is timeless. And Christ is the same way because He is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created Through Him, there's nothing that was made apart from Him. He is God Almighty. And He is to be worshipped as such. Christian, 
You have to be on guard because the lies are going to come and they are going to keep coming. They're going to knock on your door with a smile on their face. They're going to be good-hearted, good-minded people. They'll flash a Bible in your face and they will directly, deliberately misrepresent Christ. Some of them won't even know what they're actually doing. They might have been born into it. They might have been suckered into it. They might think it's right. They don't actually have the correct word translated of God. They have an intentional misrepresentation that seeks to praise men over God. They are deceived. And we should witness to them in love. They need it. Let us pray.